Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your esoteric host, Abraham. And I am your hiding in the desert with a cult host, Shane, I guess? Wow, I'm excited to learn more about that. This is a psychology (laughs) podcast. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're in Halloween season. We made it. We made it. Spooky time. Yeah. And so if you're joining us for the first time, then just know that we are about to do a series of spooky episodes, which we do every October to celebrate the spooky season. So get your pumpkin spice. Get your, I guess, circus peanuts if you like that kind of candy for trick-or-treating. I don't know what you like. But whatever you get to snack on as you listen to the series, we hope that you enjoy it and have a lot of fun with this. This is our sixth year. This is our fourth year doing Halloween themed episodes. So for most of the time we've been a podcast in October, we have celebrated the spooky themed type topics. Mm -hmm. And this year we're doing something even a little bit more directly themed than we have in the past, (laughs) which is... In previous years, we've taken on various topics, zombies and witches and things like that that are Halloween related. Voodoo, vampires, lycanthropy, like clinical lycanthropy and all that. Yeah, all all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, and and the history of Halloween, I think, at one point. Yeah. And this year, we kind of accidentally went Satan-themed for everything. (laughs) So, yes, this will be not only uh, spooky season, but specifically Satan spooky season. Yeah, Saw Wayne or whatever, you know, like it's it's all Saturnalia, all the fun stuff. Yeah, we are talking about, I'm going to just drop all those like weird, like strange, like kind of occultist words in here just to see which Hell one yeah. lands. Vamachara, Simulacra, you know, all the fun stuff. So no, we are, we are diving into uh, a, a satanic theme, both real world and a little bit less real world. So we're going to have yeah. some fun on this one. I think. Absolutely. And if you like what you hear today, then you can support us in various ways. Join us on Patreon, like and subscribe, leave a rating and review shop at our store. You can start a cultish magical path thing that's actually secular and call it why we do what we do and give us some amount of credit Uh for that or something and that would be cool too but i'll talk more about the ways that you can support us at the end of this discussion if you are listening to this on the day that the episode comes out then uh, i would like to just wish you a national cinnamon roll day yes it's also national taco day so it's a good food day i think nice it's international walk to school day it's also international. Well, it's not international, but it is a day. It's kindness to animals day. I love that. National kale day. Um, have you ever had massaged kale? Yes. You have to massage it because like you have to like break up the fibers or else it's too fibrous to eat. Yeah. I mean, you can't eat it, but it tastes much better when it's massaged. It's really Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to massage a little bit. It's also national pumpkin seed day. Big fan of that. Mm. In addition to it being kindness to Animal Day, it's also World Animal Day. I'm a supporter of that. Right. Also, there are several weeks that we're going to acknowledge. Uh, one of them is Active Aging Week as opposed to Passive Aging Week, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Instead of aging happening to it, you do it on purpose. Makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> cool. 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 Animal Welfare Week. I love all this. All of this like, love for animals. This is great. Yeah. It all aligns really well. It's also Great Books Week. So, uh, you know, I think this is a really good time to start reading some spooky books. If you're a Stephen King fan, go grab some. That is a very good point. You, yeah, you're right. I, this should be Stephen King book week or month, maybe. <laughs> right? Yeah. It is Mental Illness Awareness Week. So that's a, a very important one that is near and dear to our hearts for sure. Uh, yes. And it is also, as far as months go, it is Hispanic Heritage Month. So please go celebrate. Yay. National Down Syndrome Awareness Month as well, which is great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month, so uh, really important to get some education around that. Absolutely. And Spina Bifida Awareness Month as well. Yeah, there's a lot going on in October, but the most important day of all of these days is International Abraham Day. So (laughs) please welcome me in celebrating our good friend, host of the show, creator brainstormer of the show abraham happy birthday my friend oh thank you <laughs> that, was, that was so much uh fanfare thank you i appreciate it you're the reason we're all here <laughs> indeed well thank you and yes it is it is my birthday um and that's fun so uh, even more big thanks for people who are you know listening in uh, and on my, on my birthday yeah good deal. i know so great this isn't going to happen very often. So so go eat a cinnamon roll for, for Abraham's birthday. <laughs> yeah, and go be kind to animals. That, that too. Yeah, all the good stuff. Yeah. 
All right. Well, let's let's get to our topic at hand. As we said, we're into spooky month now, which is great. I love having my birthday in October for this reason, because Halloween is one of my <laughs> absolute favorite holidays. Yeah. It's just fun. You know, it's fun. It's silly. It's kind of weird. Um, and you just get all these really interesting things to unpack inside of these topics that we always find more and more. Our list now spans multiple years of things we like to talk about in Halloween. Yeah. And then oftentimes we'll come up with even more when we get into Halloween season. So We've got we got fodder Mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Yeah, you're going to be with us for a long time. Yes. And today we're talking about my left hand. Well, not my left hands, but left hands generally and not really left hands, but the direction that they go, which is left. Yes. Today we are covering left hand path magic, or as we will discover throughout this episode, another phrase for it is black magic. Ooh! In this episode, we're going to learn what Christmas, Jupiter, mustaches, and cod pieces all have in common, <laughs> <laughs> which is something. <laughs> oh my word! It is going to be a wild time. I put together these notes, and I'm actually kind of surprised that witches didn't come up. But witches are a common thing tied to black magic and left hand path magic and all that fun stuff. But fair point. Fair point. I think we we need a little bit of background on this. We got to start somewhere, and the place to start is this strange scholarly study of Western esotericism or esotericism, however you want to say it. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've heard it both ways as they'd say on psych, Yeah, which is like an Uh old show that's been off the air for years now. Uh, Yeah. yeah. It's it's a good show though. (laughs) Yeah. So to start this discussion around this, we got to understand what esotericism is and Western esotericism is a concept that incorporates a variety of ideas that include scholarly studies of Gnosticism, which is basically Gnostic. Gnostic is is a term for knowledge, Mm. a Greek term for knowledge, Hermeticism and the New Age movement, which you might go, none of those things are related. (laughs) But what does any of this mean? Nobody knows. Nobody can agree on what esotericism actually means. Yes. And this is actually not uncommon in the space of general sort of this occult and satanic orientation and all that. There's a lot of unique schisms and splits in there. But besides the fact that no one can agree, there is some agreement that esotericism refers to these idea of inner traditions, quote unquote, inner traditions that primarily focus on quote, a universal spiritual dimension of reality as opposed to the merely external religious institutions and dogmatic systems of established religions, end quote. So basically the way I read this is what we understand about current religion is not correct. So let's explore other ways to look at the world that doesn't involve science. And so that's kind of what you'll discover as we go forward is that a lot of the new age movement, like when you talk about like astrology and all of those things that comes up in this space. And that'll start to make more sense as we kind of like dive into those little elements. But a lot of what you find in esotericism is that there are discussions around this idea of secret spiritual teachings. And these secret spiritual teachings are reserved for elite practitioners. And you find many practices embedded in small, isolated groups or cults, though it's not specifically reserved for those on that particular fringe. Some people might subscribe to the idea of nature, which we'll talk about, and things like astrology and kind of have their own unique mythos around that. But the idea is is there are these secret spiritual teachings that are often reserved for those elite folks or like those folks that are in the inner circles. Not uncommon to try and recruit is almost like a marketing strategy how to get people to your cause is to say we've got these this is a it's only reserved for an elite group of people the vips so if you want to know you've got to join our ranks scientology kind of operates in a similar way yeah yeah you could say scientology operates in that space you could say multi-level marketing kind of operates Mm. in that space yeah there's a lot of kind of things like that like if you want success and riches and fame and treasures and all the things that go along with it You've got to get into the inner circle to be able to access that inner knowledge or that universal, that that secret knowledge of the world. Yeah. There are three primary views of esotericism that we should talk about. Esotericism as an enchanted worldview Mm -hmm. is one, as higher knowledge is two, and as rejected knowledge as three. So let's unpack each of those individually. The enchanted worldview perspective of esotericism basically says that Everything in the universe is interrelated and that there is no need for understanding causal chains or relations 
And they also argue that the disenchanted worldview is that of the scientific community. I was going to say, this kind of rings... Explicitly. <laughs> I hear this, and I'm like, oh, this is not really not a far off from a scientific philosophy in general. Yeah. So, so basically, they're saying that everything's interrelated. There's no need to understand the world or phenomenon. And then the disenchanted world just says that, oh, you actually believe in science. So there's like a, a little bit of a schism here and a weird thing where they just go, you know, it's, it's very much so the world according to the dude. It's like, it's cool, man. Everything like it's very like that, that like kind of stereotypical hippie definitely subscribes to that enchanted worldview. It's all cool, man. It all it's all related. We're all one. That's very much so that worldview that distilled down groovy. Groovy is right. <laughs> I was, you know, I was inspired in the moment to choose that as my response. <laughs> so from this worldview, there are six essential characteristics. I'll just list them real quick and then we'll unpack each of those. So we're still in the enchanted worldview. We've got correspondences, living nature, imagination and mediations, experience of transmutation, practice of concordance and transmission. So in correspondence, the idea here is that there's correspondence between all living things and direct relations between the macrocosms and microcosms, as above, so below. Uh huh. So you might say that. And this is sort of where astrology comes from. Yeah, basically, like everything is related, and that's why the planets affect your behavior. So thank you. That's where Jupiter comes in, right? Sure. Jupiter makes you mad about stuff, and also Mercury makes it so that your computers don't work. <laughs> but that's what correspondence is essentially saying. Another part of this is the idea of living nature. And the idea of living nature is that the natural universe has its own life force. And because it has its own life force, it, the universe itself is a living kind of entity that influences everything that exists within it. Almost like how our body has a bunch of small, unique cells that do a lot of different things. But for our cells, our body is their universe. And that's kind of what this is arguing. We're all just on the shell of a giant cosmic turtle i know maturing <laughs> the next part as i mentioned <laughs> imagination and mediation so this is rituals symbolic images mandalas spirits etc these are all tools to foster imagination and to help access varying levels of reality i could not have said it any other way i really tried to i tried to like break it down i was like i don't know how to say this other than somebody is trying to get elevated word now experience of transmutation essentially says that practice of whatever spiritual practice you're looking at transforms the person on a spiritual level and not figuratively literally transforms that person on a, a spiritual level all towards the path of to gain gnosis or to gain knowledge. So basically everything you're doing is designed to transform you as a person so that you can reach this higher level of knowledge. Okay. There is practice of concordance. This is all religious and spiritual practices emerge from the same root systems. And as such, we can bring them all together in some sort of unity. Yes. So esotericism basically says we can unite the world religions and spiritual practices by understanding that they all start from the same place and they all have the same goal. That's essentially what that says. Yeah. They've got common ground somewhere that allows them to work together. Yeah. Which is like a nice thought, I think. Yeah. And then transmission is the information that is gained and any sort of higher teaching should be transferred from master to disciple. So anything that the master learns needs to be transmitted to and taught to those folks that follow them. Okay. So we just unpacked the enchanted worldview, the six characteristics being correspondence, living nature, imagination and mediations, experience of transmutation, practice of concordance and transmission. The next one we mentioned was higher knowledge, but first we have lower knowledge in the form of ads. Okay, so we're back from that, what could only be described as anti-Gnosticism, and we're going to move <laughs> on to talking about the next of the three world primary views of esotericism, which is as higher knowledge. Yes. So underneath higher knowledge, this is essentially an alternative or really the opposite of the enchanted world perspective. And I can actually kind of get on board with this idea. The idea behind this is that uh, to some degree, let me let me clarify to some degree, because when, right. when it gets when we get to the end of it, you're going to be like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's bad. Yeah. All of it's a little weird somewhere. Yeah. All of it's a little weird. It, 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 you can't subscribe to all of it. I don't think um, some people can, I guess. Uh, Alistair Crow Crowley can. The <laughs> idea Behind this is that study and practice within esotericism should lead to scholarly analysis and usage. I really like that, 
right? Yeah. You're practicing okay. something. You should analyze it. You should understand it. You should go through that that space. Yeah. But since esotericism implies that there's a higher knowledge beyond what we know and beyond levels of reality, practices focus on moving towards gaining said higher knowledge. So that's everything they're doing is like everything that that person is doing is trying to move towards having a better understanding of these multiple levels of the universe. Scholarly analysis, is like a trigger word, like gets me all excited. I know. That's what I did. I, did the same thing. I was like, ooh, I like that. And then. Yes. And then it takes a bit of a turn because where you might think, oh, this does sound very scientific, where this immediately breaks off from what might be considered as a scientific path, arguably whose primary goal is to communicate that science out to the world to help people and to further our knowledge as a species. And the this version of this and this view and as higher knowledge, this is to be kept secret instead. So yes. we're now off the path of science, which we kind of were barely on it to begin with. But so despite there being access to higher knowledge, the masses must not know so this sounds real Scientological, if you ask <laughs> us uh, what we think about yeah. it. It certainly seems to land on that version of things. And honestly, this, this to me also lines more with conspiratorial thinking, which looks at the – a lot of it is like I started on the outside looking in, and now I'm on the inside where all of the real knowledge is that's being kept from people – by the forces that be. You see, you see what I mean? Like, it's not exactly the same, but I see some overlap there, the same sort of magical thinking. And for those of you who have not listened to our Scientology episode, something that is really important to know is that a lot of the basis of Scientology is based in this exact thing, is that higher knowledge is only attained through the inner circle. Yeah. And so this idea of higher knowledge is a core tenet of Scientological practices. You can see the parallel. It's, it's like yeah. looking in a mirror. <laughs> Except that they just use aliens instead of magic. Yeah. Yeah. Through thetans and e-meters, that sort of thing. Oh, all the fun stuff. All right. So the last little bit of esotericism is the idea of rejected knowledge. And basically this view posits that everything within esotericism is just what has been thrown away by modern society and academia. Basically, it's saying that like what you're studying and what we know, what all of our knowledge is just stuff that's been discarded by the masses because they don't understand it. And that's kind of the, the equivalent of just going. You just don't get it. <laughs> and this is where flat earthers and astrologists will unite. This is this is the intersection yeah. where they go, oh, no, 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 we don't follow consensus. But this this idea of kind of the rejected taking the rejected knowledge is going to play a big role in in some of the, the ways that we look at how like Satanism shows up too. not entirely, but a little bit that kind of like value is there. This is even more aligned with the conspiratorial thinking. And I mean, it's right there. It's flat earthers. It's astrologists. It's, uh -huh. Yeah. I imagine that this is the birds are not real <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh -huh. thing. That makes a lot of sense is that idea that like this is all legitimate knowledge. I, I think actually a lot of what we've been hearing in the news lately about aliens and UAPs and the government hearings and talks on this, like the evidence they are presenting is the same evidence they've had for the last 70 years, which is to say things that are on the fringe, low resolution, low information zones, but they're like, that's the stuff that's being hidden and they're rejecting it, but it's still like, it's a, it's very useful. It's critically relevant information as opposed to it just being not right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Exactly. And that's kind of the thing here is this, you're going to find this in any sort of, I guess, and I don't want to apply this term to the entirety of, I don't want to overgeneralize this term for folks that like practice in this space, but there is this kind of contrarian view that comes up where it's like, even though there is consensus around this particular scientific evidence or something like that, they go, no, 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 no. Or they're the folks that go, well, sure, but what if this wasn't actually true? And here's blah, 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 blah. When it's like, no, vaccines definitely don't cause autism. We know that. Right. And then they're the kind of folks that will go, well, what, but what if, what if it did? And it's like, no, but, but it doesn't. So we know that. And it's kind of that contrarianist viewpoint that. I think you'll find it, which is the, the annoying part of all this, right? Like if people who are in touch with nature, people who want to believe that planets are, like influence your behavior, whatever. Most of the time, that's not that harmful. But those folks that kind of reject it and pursue it and teach it as like an alternative view or alternative fact, that's when it becomes a problem. You know, I generally want to support the idea of someone who wants to oppose something they see as being fundamentally wrong 
and I think you can look at like where science was during like the dark ages and in right. the European, the dark ages is like, that was people who were in the minority shouting against the blinding majority of saying, this is crazy. What you guys are doing is, is wrong. So the idea of rebelling against the authority and saying that's wrong, where we support that is where the person who's doing that comes from a place of, I have actual evidence. I have actual reason to believe this versus I'm doing this because I don't have evidence, which right. is my evidence because I don't have anything, to, any reason to actually believe this. That's my reason for belief. Right. And it's like, that's where we differ from on the idea of like the fact that they're rejecting it is because you're rejecting it on the grounds that you don't have an ev evidence and that's your evidence versus you're rejecting it on the grounds that you do have evidence and that's your evidence. Right. Exactly. That's exactly my point. Okay. We're talking about all this esotericism because it's in service of understanding what is left hand path magic, or you might also talk about this as understanding why is it left versus right, Vamachara versus Daximachara, I think I said that about right, <laughs> Yeah, which is sort of related to these uh, Sanskrit words in Eastern traditions, if you will. So right hand path magic, left hand path magic, what does anything that we're talking about have to do with hands and limbs and walkways, we're going to tell you. So esotericism is a space where all of the roughshod and discarded ideas of the universe have been left to die, essentially. And it's kind of like an island of misfit ideas. But one of those ideas is magic. And yes, we're talking about legit magic. And we're not talking about like the idea of like David Copperfields and David Blaine's and Chris Angels. We're not talking about that type of magic. Penn and Tellers. Yeah, the Penn and Tellers. We're not talking about that kind of fun. We're talking about like actual ritualistic ceremonial magic that people believe it not that we actually think the magic is real right 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 and the david copperfields of scholarly study would have you believe that magic never went away rather magic or you might see it spelled with a ck at the end which i might just call magic because it's fun magic their idea is that this is alive and well and real but only exists in small corners of the world among esoteric practitioners david blaine too mainstream yeah no way. He's not part of that higher knowledge crowd. He's got, he's too personable. Yeah. Even though he's not really that personable. He's a weird dude. Now, <laughs> magic includes rituals, spiritual divinations, all those things. They're designed to either invoke, manipulate, or manifest some type of supernatural force, some being or some entity from the natural world. This is going to be really important that we talk about this. If esotericism is talking about the universe being a, having its own life force and being a, a naturally occurring universe, then what essentially is happening within magic is that magic tries to use that, tries to pull from the natural world and use that and manipulate it in ways that are different than maybe what we understand from a scientific community. You know, this is totally an aside, but it kind of occurs to me, this seems to be sort of the logic that superheroes operate in. I kind of like, I get the sense of like superheroes, basically they're in our real universe, but they're pulling in features of the universe that are like not readily available to most people to give yeah. them additional powers. I don't know if the people who wrote superhero comics ever had that directly in mind, at least when they were sort of founding those ideas. But I see a lot, like I'm immediately imagining like Dr. Doctor Strange and Scarlet Witch and yeah. all those characters that are essentially meant to drive from the real world, these supernatural abilities, if you will. Yeah. Specifically Scarlet Witch, like what she's known to do in comics is use something called chaos magic, which chaos magic is absolutely something that exists in our real world when they talk about like as a concept or a principle within this space. So chaos magic is a thing that gets talked about within the left hand path magic space. And absolutely, Scarlet Witch, like, that's exactly what her her magic power is. It's not just magic. It's chaos magic. So, and and that's why it's so, like, unpredictable and harmful. Didn't think Marvel Comics was going to make an appearance today, did you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love, I love when that happens. It's all related. It's, we're, we're in a living universe. <laughs> See, it all comes, it, it just comes right back together. And speaking of which, this is where right hand and left hand path magic come in. So these are opposing views on magic and most often used within occult and ceremonial magic writings. And you also, I think I've seen this described as like white magic and black magic is sort of how mm -hmm. I've seen, also seen it aligned. 
Right. So right hand path magic is considered the more benevolent and aligned with the idea of white magic, or it's typically used for selfless purposes. So people who practice right hand path magic are typically what they describe as good. Those who practice are usually wise men and women, healers, white witches and wizards. So like Gandalf the White would be an example of somebody who practices right hand path magic for the good of others in a selfless way. And maybe Dumbledore, probably Hermione. Yeah, exactly. Voldemort, not so much. He's the left hand path magic, or which we'll get to, yeah. which is, as, you, as you've likely guessed, then left hand path magic is more aligned with malicious black mystics of the world. The view is used for selfish or evil purposes. Once again, breaking the world into dichotomies of literal black and white, where black is bad and white is good. Yeah. You can see the problem. You can see why that's this. a problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can see why that's a problem. It's, you know, Luke Skywalker is the right hand without a right hand. Darth Vader is the left hand with no left hands because he's had all his limbs cut off. So, and then Ahsoka is like right in the middle. So uh, it's, a, it's a whole thing if you like Star Wars. But within this practice of left hand path magic, there are seven artists prohibite or prohibited arts that Johannes Hartlieb canonized into magic law. That's a sentence that I never thought I would say. <laughs> it's a thing that exists. It came out in the 1400s, but it is a thing. But before we get into these arts, here are some other things that are prohibited. But somehow they've made it here. Some ads. All right. So we were talking about the unforgivable curses, Cruciatus, um, we have Cadaver. Oh, sorry. No, we're talking about the other prohibited arts. So we've got nigromancy, and this is demonic magic, usually performed by someone in possession of a grimoire, which maybe you've heard of, which is a textbook of magic of sorts. Uh huh. And for people who don't understand science, sign textbooks are essentially grimoires for them. They're like, whoa. <laughs> Look, I can make fire turn colors by adding chemicals. Ah! That's yeah, the whole thing. That's it. Yeah, that's it. There is also geomancy, which is magic that utilizes or controls stone, sand, and dirt. And what they do is they don't like necessarily, they're not like earthbenders, just to be clear. They're not like making like earthquakes and doing <laughs> like that. What they're doing is they use rituals, they use stones, sand, dirt, and rituals. And it's used to either read or interpret knowledge from other levels of existence. So, setting up runes, setting up all these things to be able to kind of pull information from esoteric planes. Is this uh, like where crystals come in? People use crystals to clean their chi? Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. Hydromancy, and this, as you might guess from the title, is magic using water, used in scrying. I mean, this allows practitioners to see pictures or visions. I'm imagining the pensive from Harry Potter mm -hmm. right now, but but otherwise, yeah, using using matter, uh, water as your, your crystal ball. You'll see this in like places where people are using divining pools or like those types of things where people will get into a pool of water and like meditate and stuff like that. I mean, arguably, I guess you could say like a um, seclusion tanks, the isolation tanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, sensory deprivation tanks. Yeah. Yeah. You're floating in water. I guess that's part of that's part of the hydromancy part of that, too. Cool. So I guess you could say that. <laughs> yeah. There's also aeromancy, which you would imagine it has to do with air, except for. What happens here is divination includes throwing sand, dirt, seeds into the air and analyzing those patterns, but also includes interpreting things like thunder, comets, falling stars, and clouds. So cloud gazing is aeromancy. So don't look at clouds anymore. <laughs> what I imagine when you were describing this is someone th like throwing things in the air and then they comes down their eyes and whatever they then can see when their eyes are being occluded <laughs> with <laughs> dust and other particles is like their vision. Yeah. Your world is painful and cloudy. I can't make out any details. <laughs> it's the equivalent of when they try to spread Donnie's ashes in Big Lebowski. <laughs> That's what aeromancy is. <laughs> <laughs> Second Big Lebowski reference. Nice. Yeah. You didn't think he was going to show up, huh? I did not. You know, I, I was expecting I cod pieces uh, and, and we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> oh, we're going to. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, the <laughs> next one is pyromancy, which again, pretty immediately relevant in the title. This has to do with fire. Uh huh. So throw some materials into a fire, see what comes up. Um, I think we've seen this a lot represented in movies. They burn something and they'll yes. like, look at the flames. Uh huh. But also using fire to make sacrifices to the gods or deities, also to interpret omens. I think of the burnt offerings of like Greek texts yes. and, and also some of the religious texts and that sort of thing. Yeah. As we go forward, I think it's important to know that, again, they're not controlling fire or water or anything like that, which is so disappointing when you talk yeah. about magic. Like, Come if on. you talk about magic, like, shouldn't I be able to throw a fireball? Yeah. I can't throw a fireball, so it's not really pyromancy, but you would assume that it would be. 
maybe it's pyromancy in the world of Warcraft, but there's also chiromancy, which is palm reading. And so palm reading enters the chat here. It's used to interpret good omens and directly linked to astrology. So palm reading has a direct link in line to astrology, but in other practices like in voodoo and stuff like that, it's going to have a different interpretation as well. So, but that's palm reading and any reading hand lines and all that is, is called chiromancy. Got it. And the last one is scapulomancy. Scapulomancy. Uh-huh. Some of that nature. This is magic interpreting breaks and cracks in the scapula to read the future. Breaks in the scapula would come from heating the bone with hot coals. I also think we've seen sort of versions of this in some like movies and TV shows a little bit. Yeah. But a little less common. But yeah, the idea of sort of, you know, animal bones, specifically the scapula. Right. So now left hand path magic has stone magic, has water magic, fire magic, air magic, bone magic, hand magic. It's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. With our powers unite, we summon Captain Planet. <laughs> yeah, it's like a weird, it's that weird Captain Planet that like keeps talking to you about other planes of existence. And you're like, I can't, no, there's pollution. I need to deal with that here today on, on this plane of existence. Did you so. see the the Don Cheadle Captain Planet? Like, <laughs> yeah. short. Yeah. Everyone is broccolis. It's, it's trees. He's like, trees, trees, trees. And just like turning people into trees. Uh-huh. That was pretty funny. So good. So as we talk about this idea of left-hand path magic, we did an episode on voodoo. Go listen to it. It's super interesting. And it is worth diving into that if you want to know more about that specific topic. But the reason it comes up here is that voodoo often gets associated with left-hand path magic because of palm reading, because of some of the things that come up, some of the different rituals and practices and healing and all that. But there are distinct interpretations within voodoo versus black and white magic. And voodoo is very much so its own thing. Voodoo practitioners and hoodoo practitioners, they make it very clear that they are not left-hand path magic practitioners. Like, they definitely, like, distinguish themselves from that space. And if you listen to that episode, you can kind of hear the distinction between that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, now, uh, a little bit of crossover here. We have, as I said, we're doing sort of Satan-themed-ish episodes this year, and Satanism and Luciferianism are often labeled as left-hand path practices. So let's, let's go ahead and unpack that a little bit. Yes. So if we hold the idea that left hand path magic is about self-serving individualism, then some tenets of Satanism, like kind of the maybe some current iterations of Satanism, they don't really align. So what we need to do is go and spend a little bit of time looking at the Satanic Temple's seven tenets. They call them the fundamental tenets. Now, the Satanic Temple is its own organization with this is not an endorsement of the Satanic Temple, but because of their own their own stuff, they got some they got some of their own stuff going on. And I'll just I'll leave it at that. But these tenets are kind of like the core belief systems, almost like the Ten Commandments in the Bible. And somebody's going to be so mad that I just compared the Satanic (laughs) Temple to the Bible. But hear me out. It's a set of rules. Both of these are a set of rules. And so the first tenant, the first of these seven tenants, is one should strive to act with compassion and empathy toward all creatures in accordance with reason. The next is the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. Mm Mm-hmm. The next one is one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone, which is why Satanists tend to support abortion rights. Yes. And number four, freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend, to willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. Interesting. Beliefs should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's beliefs. Number six, people are fallible. If one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might be caused. And then finally, number seven, every tenant is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility and action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. So in conclusion, did we just become Satanists? (laughs) I think the more you learn about Satanism, the more appealing it might sound to your average uh, reasonable person in a way. That's how he gets you. That's right. That is how they get you. And we'll unpack a lot of this more when we, we start talking about this. But one thing that struck me just just now and just reading through these is, I don't know if it's ironic or coincidental or intentional or what it was, that seven tends to be sort of a sacred number in Christianity regarded often as being holy and having to do with holy things. Sure. And then there are seven seven tenets of the satanic temple, and that, that, that makes me chuckle a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll find that people in this space tend to be very tongue in cheek, and I can almost guarantee that that is that was intentional. Probably, yeah. 
when you go on their donations, like you get like they set it up as like the automatic donation is like 66 and stuff like that. So, yeah, <laughs> they, they do. They do all kinds of stuff like that. So if you ask us current iterations of Satanism, according to the Satanic Temple specifically, don't really align with selfish acts per se. We'll note this is different than the Church of Satan, which has a different view on Satanic practices, as well as many other Satanic groups that have previously existed and, and do currently exist that also have different philosophies. But this is just pulling from the Satanic Temple specifically. Right. And we'll unpack all of that stuff as we go into some of uh, like Satanism and some of that stuff too, as we go in our, this is some of our episodes, but exactly. We are talking about left-hand path magic and it's worth talking about when black magic goes bad. Okay. And so left-hand path magic is often viewed as an individualistic practice. If you talk about the ideas of black magic or anything like that, what they are talking about specifically is selfish, malicious practices that benefit the user and the user's followers, right? It's not necessarily selfless acts. And so many practitioners engage in rituals for self-serving means. That's kind of what the idea is behind this. So moving into this next section, a few things to remember. Some argue that right-hand versus left-hand path magic is not inherently good or bad. Rather, they're just two sides of the same coin with similar aims to seek, specifically that of seeking higher knowledge. The pursuit of that knowledge and its eventual use is where you might then apply what you would maybe call a value of good or bad and where that discussion comes in because whether you're using it to help other people or help yourself and presumably something is more selfish if it's at the expense of others versus it just being helpful to yourself. You know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. So when we talk about kind of the harms that have happened in the pursuit of higher knowledge through this left-hand path magic type of philosophy... The best place to start is a man named Alistair Crowley. So uh, you may be familiar with this person. You may have heard his name. It's sometimes pronounced Crowley or Crowley. I've heard both of them. But he is widely known as the, quote, wickedest man in the world. He was known for extreme practices around left-hand path rituals. A lot of times he was trying to open portals to other dimensions and bring demons into the world through sex magic and all this stuff. There's a lot of there's a lot of kind of. Things happening there. But without going into a full biography on the man, there's plenty of stuff to go out there. If you want to know about this guy, go listen to a true crime podcast. Go listen to an occult podcast. I promise you there is <laughs> ample information about this. That's going to be far more graphic than we're going to share here as well. But here are a few things you need to know. First, this guy wrote 45 separate works on ritualistic magic and practice. He also wrote 19 poetry books. None of them are good. All right. He often advocated for sexual freedom but was reportedly a staunch masochist, sexist, and racist. He would often use these rituals as a means to abuse and hurt his disciples, impart abuses on members of the public, and generally do things that, again, were at the cost and expense of other people and, and caused harm to others. Just as an example, one thing that he would do is he would bring people into his like desert compound when he was living in Egypt, practicing this type of magic, and he would make them eat these cakes that included blood, semen, and feces as part of like ritualistic magic. So yeah, not really the nice, he's not like a good friend is what I'm yeah. saying. So apparently he earned the nickname wickedest man in the world because he was open about sexual freedom within ritual sex magic. And to sum that up, he tried to summon demons through butt sex. That is a real thing. Yes. I mean, it's a reductionist way to look at it, but also is exactly what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. In thinking about this, though, I mean, you've got you've got a lot of heavy contenders for the wickedest man in the world. There's been a lot of people who I think have caused significantly more harm than he was able to. He he was obviously very malicious about it, but I mean, Hitler tends to occur to me as the person who's like the best archetype of doing horrible, horrible, terrible things to people. Funny you should mention that he's coming up. <laughs> so. Anton LaVey is somebody who's also known in the Satanist, the circles around that. He's the founder of the Church of Satan. He got the nickname Evilest Man in the World. These nicknames are so stupid. <laughs> he, he was also considered highly charismatic. People tend to, like, were able, like, he was extremely personable. People would go talk to him. He helped amass a small following around the church, the Church of Satan, which still exists today. But he was supposedly involved in a plot to assassinate Ted Kennedy, which doesn't feel very satanic when you think about the tenets of Satanism. Yeah. But it's also, I guess if you interpret Satanism another way, that does feel satanic. It's all very confusing. 
Yeah. To wrap your head around. If you grew up in a Christian society, it's all very confusing to, to kind of figure out. As you said, we'll talk a little bit more about him when we talk about Satanism. But uh, but just as you said, like if you watch videos of him, he he's kind of quiet. Uh-huh. He wasn't very loud or outspoken. He sort of spoke slowly and softly and very measured. Very measured. He was fairly I want to say endearing exactly, but he he sort of spoke in a way that I think really invite. He really listens to people, and he really sort of I'm not unlike Joe Rogan, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, in that way, they were both bald too. Yeah, yeah. He listened and then invited them to sort of take part in it. And then he kind of just, uh, I don't know. Anyway, moving on. As you mentioned, uh, we've got uh, Hitler is also on the list here. Uh-huh. Yes. I sort of jumped the gun on that, but but here we are. His nickname was the worst ever. <laughs> it's just a weird, a weird dude for so many reasons. But he was obsessed with the occult and spirituality to the point that he had specific divisions of his army of his entire group seeking out magic relics. He was actively practicing black left-hand magic, black magic while in the throes of world war II and being his dictator self. So he specifically sought the Holy grail and the Ghent altarpiece. The Ghent altarpiece was a magic artifact that supposedly had, was a, a on it was encoded a map to other world treasures Basically, how to travel into other dimensions, other planes of existence to find treasures and weaponry that would help him win the war. He spent time and resources and efforts during World War II doing all the horrible things he was doing, also seeking this stuff. So this is, again, an example of like how selfish, malicious, left-hand path magic, black magic can bring in people like Hitler. That's where the mustaches come in, by the way. There is a non-zero number of movies that have reference to this as a plot line. Even Captain America, you know, the idea of Red Skull and Hydra, yeah. like this actually is like it, although he didn't, there wasn't actually a Red Skull and Hydra that was based on the reality of what Hitler was trying to do. I think similar in how uh, like Wonder Woman also had some of that yeah. going on. Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones was the next one I was going to come All up. All of like, them? Yeah. All of them? <laughs> <laughs> yes. They were all like trying to look for the Ark of the Covenant and all of that. So those was inspired by the fact that that was really going on among the Nazis. Yeah. Like literally every Indiana Jones movie. The villain in all of them is Nazis, except for Temple of Doom. <laughs> I mean, Nazis are easy to use as a villain, I gotta say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. All right. Well, we do have some other fun, interesting tidbits and some take home points. But how about some uninteresting tidbits and some um, forget points? And those are ads. <laughs> Well, let's get to a little bit of science before we get to some inter- interesting tidboints, tidbits, tidboints, tidboints, love tidboints and <laughs> take home bits, the, the take home bits and tidboints. Those are my uh, <laughs> spoonerisms <laughs> for the day. There's been some publications in peer review about this. So we have Von Struckrad, 2005. This calls for multiple fields of practice to work together to help interpret Western esotericism. But shocker problem is nobody has a good definition for what any of this is. So the scientific inquiry is quite difficult to actually carry out. Yeah, so that was in 2005. In my search for articles on science and black magic or left-hand path magic, there was nothing. But they did find some super interesting things. So Granholm in 2009 found that despite left-hand path magic practitioners often having a right-wing political view, so that's also something to consider as well, is that a lot of times people who like consider themselves left-hand path practitioners tend to be right-wing, yeah. which is... It makes sense when you kind of think about it. Yeah. But there are some groups like the Temple of Set or Dragon Rouge that actually have advocacy work around fostering animal rights and protecting animals. So that was kind of an interesting thing to find. Yeah. Again, people are complex. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. We have Kuhn, Amlani, and Rensik in 2008 aims to elevate the cognitive processes related to observing magicians perform illusions. Not tricks, not but tricks. illusions. Nope. <laughs> they set a call to action to investigate processes related to attention control. Because a lot of when talking about magic and illusions, it has to do primarily with grabbing your attention to one thing and not another. It's perception distortion and influencing your choices through subtle manipulations. None of this article is related to left-hand path magic at all, which was kind of disappointing, but... It does speak to the idea of magic and what looks like magic, which has a lot more to do with basically manipulating your audience. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that really concludes what we understand of left-hand path magic in terms of like 
the study of it and definitions of it, but there are some fun tidbits. The first thing is, supposedly, David Bowie was obsessed with left-hand path magic. And this is where the cod pieces come in, because if everybody remembers Labyrinth, I don't know where he got that outfit or why they put him in that. Fun. That's all I'm saying. That's where the copies come. But but he was he was obsessed. Like he would incorporate a lot of the imagery and a lot of the languaging into some of his art and some of his some of his stuff. He would read a lot of occultist books and stuff. But I mean, also people would assume that he was into kind of black magic because he was so subversive to like cultural norms too. Interesting. Interesting. Uh huh. Maybe he saw his work on Labyrinth as that being more of a documentary than like a. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The film. William S. Burroughs cursed Truman Capote using black magic, and then Capote got arrested, so it apparently worked. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the cause-effect oh. relations that, and shit there that I think is uh, is spurious and non-existent. Um, but who knows if it actually worked, except us. It didn't, because magic's not real. Right. And then also, if you read William S. Burroughs, if you read Naked Lunch, then you know he probably just like threw out a curse in the throes of like a heroin nod, so he probably wasn't wasn't really all there when he tried to curse Truman Capote, I would imagine. Like, that's a whole different, whole different set of circumstances. Fair. All right. Christopher Lee, who is Saruman the White in Lord of the Rings, had supposedly the largest collection of occult books on the planet Ooh. in his library. He also played guitar and wrote a Christmas EP with the song Jingle Hell on it, which you can actively currently listen to on Spotify. So that's where Christmas comes in. Man, love Christopher Lee. The guy's fantastic. Wild. So wild. All right. So we got our cod piece. We got our Christmas relation. Let's see. We mentioned Jupiter. Have we gotten to mustaches yet? Or is that still coming up? Yeah. Hitler was the mustaches thing. Oh, that's right. Okay. Got you. And none of the research did we find anything about alchemy or necromancy, which is, you know, a shame. I, you know, what little I did find on on some of the the looking up in addition to what we've already looked at here was there, I saw these like four central tenets of the idea of left-hand magic, which had to do with, I'll just list them really quickly um, because I think this falls sort of an interesting tidbits or tidboints, if you will. Tidboints, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Take on bits. (laughs) Yeah, take on bits. (laughs) Which is just crumbs. But anyway, um, (laughs) it was individualism, individual deification, the anti and normally I'm, I'm, mis- I'm saying this wrong. It has to do with the rejection of cultural norms. And then one of them is this idea of like being in the here and now being in the, in sort of the present and that I think what I saw on a lot of all of this had to do with individualism and sometimes individualism in a selfish way, meaning like, you know, focus all of your attention onto yourself, right? Do only things that are good for you to the, and to the detriment, like if it's to the detriment of others, so be it. But I also saw that in a good way of like, you know, respect yourself, strive towards self-improvement. And those I also saw as sort of being related to this. And then like the individual deification sort of spoke to this idea of looking at occultism, not as a worship of magic, but as a means to an end for like a lot of it. When you think of the worship of magic or demons or other things you know, magical beings and that sort of thing is not that you worship them as some kind of benevolent authority, but that you, you are forming a relationship with them in the service of self-improvement, Yeah, which obviously differs from other ways that people orient to different religious traditions. So right. just some sort of interesting things I found in there. There's a lot to unpack and it's a lot of people writing about it from, I mean, I think it's the equivalent of like people kind of waxing scientific about stuff in terms of like well this is what i think here's my theory of blah 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 blah. but like coming up with like random hypotheses that can never be tested and there's also just no science in any of this so yes non-science it's very non-science nonsense non-science i have a thesis on this okay we're gonna go over a couple points great in our take-home bits so first left-hand path magic sounds really scary when you talk about it black magic sounds scary there's satan there's cults there's hidden knowledge of the universe So, of course, it sounds like a big, scary thing. But when you really look into it and you look at the people that are involved in it, it sounds like a lot of dorks are really into this. Yeah. um, And then, as you mentioned, the idea of this, these sort of epithets that were attached to these uh, historical figures, the wickedest man in the world is a stupid superlative. Like, why? Yeah. It's just it's showmanship is what that is. Yeah. People have done some terrible things in the name of ritualistic magic. There's a lot of examples of that in different spaces. But this isn't really any different than using the Bible or the Quran to enact harm on people. So like, I feel like that is a thing to remember that harms are harms. 
Yeah. Whether it's in service of God or Satan or some other dimension or butthole demons. I mean, it could be any number of things. It's still harm. So using some tool or some knowledge for harm is a bad thing. Yes. Practicing black magic makes for really great subject matter and metal bands. And the imagery is very cool. And I think that's probably what attracts a certain amount of people to it is this very starkly contrasted imagery against what you will find in most contemporary architecture and fashion and like artistic aesthetic. The sort of black magic aesthetics that are included are are very unique and stand out and, and like allow for chimeras and right. all kinds of fun shapes and patterns and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then my final take home bit is that Christopher Lee is still a wildly interesting person, even though he's passed away and you should go watch Lord of the Rings or gremlins too, or literally anything he's in some of his stories and some of his life is just so wildly interesting to me. So, uh, I don't know. He's worth checking out. That's great. I really like your commitment to the take home bits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like that. All right. Well, if you're new to us, then we have a one final last segment that we do at the end of every episode, which is where we give some recommendations. If you've been with us for a while, then hey, you get to look forward to our, our continuing ongoing segment, <laughs> with the, which is recommendations. These are sometimes related to our topic, but usually not. And today we've got a split. But before I do that, I would like to thank the people that help make this show possible. These are the people who support us on Patreon, who are amazing, wonderful people without whom we could not continue to do this work. You guys are the best. And those bests include Mike M, Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, Brian, and Ashley. Thank you all again and again and again and forever for being awesome, amazing people. Yes. We love you so much. I also need to thank my team. Thank you so much, Shane, for putting together the notes on today's topic and for recording with me today. My pleasure. Thank you, Justin, who does all of our audio engineering and production. And then thank you, Emma Wilson, who was our social media coordinator and correspondent in a way. So that is my team, again, without whom this I could not continue to do this podcast. And of course, thank you, listeners, because if I didn't have you, then it would just be me talking to a void, which it, it started out that way, you know? Yeah. It was kind of like that. We have an audience now, and that's great. We appreciate you. It's so nice. All right. Other things to add really quick. If you'd like to support us, as I said, you can pick up some merch. We've got some mugs and hats and beanies and sweaters and shirts and stickers and all kinds of things over there. You can leave us a rating and review. You can subscribe. You can join us on Patreon where you get access to bonus content like all those members that I listed, including early access to episodes, ad free episodes, that sort of thing. I think that is all that I have. Am I missing anything? No, I think that covers it. Perfect. Let's get to our fun last segment, which is our recommendations for this week. Yay! Recommendations. Since we're talking about super scary, dark things and magic and all that, and I mentioned metal, I went back into my metal catalog and I remembered that there is an album called Left Hand Path by a band called Entombed. So nice. my recommendation is go go listen to Entombed Left Hand Path, which is a just really good example of like late 80s, early 90s metal, not like the Metallica metal, but like actual metal. And so, uh, you know, the, it's 12 songs. It's a pretty decent length. It's 47 minutes for 12 songs. So it's a good it's a good listen. And, you know, it's got the common songs like Left Hand Path, Revel in Flesh, Abnormally Deceased. You know, all the the ridiculous, over-the-top 90s kind of uh, feel to metal at the time. It's a great listen if you like that sort of thing. So I thought it was like a fun a fun kind of related, uh, related bonus. That's delightful. So the band is Entombed? The band is called Entombed, and they're, they're like, their most famous album is called Left Hand Path. Left Hand Path by Entombed. You can check it out on Spotify uh-huh. or where, probably wherever you stream music. I haven't verified that, but I just assume. Yeah. I am kind of lazy. I don't really like to cook or do things in the kitchen. But nevertheless, I enjoy these like cooking shows and baking shows and YouTube channels and that sort of thing. And one of the actual best in my opinion, is one called Young Man Cooking. He's got a YouTube channel. He's got a website. He's got a couple books out. And his recipes are just always so flawlessly good. Like, even if you don't get it exactly right, it's still going to be either pretty good or absolutely fantastic. Okay. Some of them are more complex than others. Like, some take more prep. But you can choose. You can go through and find, like, which one is is easy and sounds good. I mean, he's got just probably hundreds of them at this point. His YouTube videos are super easy to follow. He does a great job, like... 
one of the things that most people, if you go into like recipes, there's like this person's life story for 500 pages. And then you get to the sure. recipe at the very end. He is very straightforward. He's like, here's the uh, sort of overall description of this dish. And then just goes through step by step. Here's how you make it. And it's really fast. It's like, this is how much oil. This is how much salt. This is how much whatever. Cook it this way. Chop it this way. Put it in here. While that's doing that, do this. And it's just like, you just boom, moves through it pretty efficiently. Like, I think most of his videos are like 15-ish minutes long. That's great. Yeah. Strong recommend. Well, I made a couple of his dishes this week and they were both fantastic. And I went back for like seconds on all of them. So nice. I, I strong recommend for Young Man Cooking, spelled Y-E-U-N-G. This YouTube channel and then a website, youngmancooking.com. Cool. Very good. I love it. All right. If you have cooking YouTube channels you'd like to recommend or some 80s, 90s metal bands that are on your mind, or you are a practitioner of left hand magic or a scholar of left hand magic or black magic or occultism or anything we've talked about in here today and would like to reach out to us, we love hearing from everybody. You should uh, join us on Patreon and send us an email directly at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. You can also reach out to us on the social media platforms where uh, you will speak with us or maybe with Emma, and we'll look forward to hearing from you there. Yeah. Anything? I'm missing or anything you'd like to add before we close out Shane no I think that covers it be safe be safe happy Halloween month and this is Abraham this is Shane we're out see ya you've been listening to why we do what we do you can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com thanks for listening and we hope you have an awesome day